Folks, when you hear folks talk about Sirius XM Radio, they talk about Howard Stern, one of the stars, but Joe Madsen is also one of the big time stars at Sirius XM. Has been, has been on their network for a very long time. Uh, he will also take Howard's check, too. Uh, of course, for long time, folks in D.C. heard him on WOL uh, Radio. He, of course, has been on the front lines of so many issues, not just in the United States, fighting for, uh, uh, fighting for Sudan. A longtime friend of Dick Gregory, he was with NAACP board member, uh, talks about all of this stuff, his life in his book, uh, Radioactive, uh, the subtitle, A Memoir of Advocacy in Action on the Air and in the Streets, and Joe is one of them black people who's a member of the Bring the Funk fan club who put the money right in my hand. I tell a whoa, story. Wait, whoa, I whoa, 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 hold on a second. No, 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 no. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. This is real, too. There you go. So Joe, I tell That's my annual dude. Every, every, <laughs> Joe gives an annual hundred dollars. I tell, I, I, to, I, I did an interview, Joe. Yeah. And I actually, I think it was with uh, Cafe Mocha. And I, I had them crying. I said, y'all don't know what it's like to, when you travel around the country and you're in, you're in Tulsa or whatever, and somebody, and like, you're on the air. And somebody black just walk up and they just go. But can I tell you a story? And they squeeze your hand can and I, they go. Can I, tell, off. can I tell you a story? It's in the book. I started a cuss jar <laughs> because I heard Howard Stern cuss a woman out. So I went to the president of Sirius XM and I said, can I do what Howard Stern does? He says, well, you know, I've heard you slip up every now and then and it's organic. And I said, he said, but sure. I said, no, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Howard's a six foot five white guy that you guys are paying a, a, you know, half a billion dollars to or more. And if I cuss out some white woman or white man, will you have my back? And he said, yeah. Now, I have my wife with me, who's the executive producer. She's always with me because she's the witness. And, <laughs> and, and we walked out, and I said, did he give me permission to do that? She said, oh, I think he did. So I started doing it. And every now and then, little old ladies would call up, God bless them. Oh, Mr. Madison, you really shouldn't do that. <laughs> you know, I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm gonna put a I, I'm gonna put a dollar and I first called it a swear jar. Mm. But then George Wallace said, black folks don't swear, yeah, they we, cuss. We cuss. And so I changed it to a cuss jar. Now this goes back to what you said about palming. Right, right. I'm at Morehouse. We're doing a voter registration, get out the vote drive. Afterward, we're you know taking selfies. Right. Folks stand up and the ministers, I walked out of there with $400 in cash and for the cuss job. <laughs> and most of the money came from ministers. <laughs> they were like, keep cussing. I can't cuss, but you are a surrogate cussing. <laughs> <laughs> I had a woman in Tulsa, she said, now Roland, I'm gonna give you this money, but, but baby, can you, can, you, can you just stop cussing? I said, look, I said, I said, I know no. how you feel. No. I said, but sometimes, uh, I said, look, some stuff, some stuff got to be said. Look. The show is called Unfiltered. I said, I got to keep it real. Well, and, and, the, and the reality, if you're going to let Howard Stern do it, then, you know, I'm, you know, you're talking about equity. <laughs> now, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I cuss. Now, I, but, now, but, I don't cuss like Reese cuss. No, no. no I'm now, not. Reese. Yeah. Reese cuss. Oh, is that right? But see, and every now and then, I have to invoke uh, my Jackson, man, uh, you know, Samuel. I just, but, but look, uh -uh, people. Uh -uh. Uh -huh. It's two. Who? Before I met Reese, there were two people who Why? I thought, what, first of all, I thought before I met Jennifer Lewis, Sam Jackson was the absolute king of motherfuckers. <laughs> but when I met Jennifer Lewis, she became the queen of motherfuckers. But Reese is the princess of Reese will okay okay this is how I got to know Reese. Reese would do these videos right. on Twitter. Right. Joe, she be I'm talking about she uses more cuss words in two minutes than a whole lot of people. And but she killing it now. She killing it. And so I said, 
Man, you know, I, I said, I gotta put her on the air. So Joe, she comes on the air, and so she's sitting on the air, and so she's talking. And I'm like, that ain't why I called your ass. I'm like, I need, so after about three or four appearances, I said, look, you got, to, I, I need you to do you. I said, I, I ain't invite your ass here to be somebody else. Mm. The person do them videos, oh, ever since then, oh, Lord. What, 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 what my girl say, let your freak flag fly, let your cuss flag fly. Well, you know, it goes back again <laughs> in the book. I, I have a, a, a chapter about success, and there was three things that I was told. Be original, be authentic, and then be daring. Mm. And when you look at folks, and particularly in our business, what you're doing, for example, nobody does this. It's, it's original. You're authentic. When you see Roland Martin, you get Roland Martin. Your guests are all authentic. That's really the That's formula of, of success. Um, but but I, I, I say this, Roland, uh, the one of the th things I wanted the book to do was to be in my voice. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the most difficult things I had with the editor and mm. Dr. Canton, uh, because they started writing it in their voice. And I always go back to what uh, Malcolm, somebody mm. said about Malcolm X and, and Al Taylor. Taylor uh -huh. Because Malcolm used to have to shape, you know, kind of shake up Alex Taylor. That's not the way, that's right. not what I'm thinking about. So I wanted it to be in my voice. The other thing I wanted was people to understand that you use your use your platform and and that the and I always remember something else. There's a chapter in there that Professor, the late Professor Ron Walters mm. said, and you and that was he, he gave a lecture and a student asked he, he chastised students about moments. You go in, you have a demonstration, you leave. Right. Go back to the campus, go back to wherever. You just had a moment. Right. What, what movement? You, it was a moment. It was, it was a moment. And, and so one student said, well, professor, what's the difference between a moment and a movement? And he said, sacrifice. All movements in human history require mm. sacrifice. And sometimes that's what you do. I had to sacrifice a job. I, I tell this story in Philadelphia. I, my first full-time talk show uh, I moved from Detroit. That was my political base. Children were born. I moved everybody to Philadelphia. And uh, I was doing a show. Now get this, midnight to 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> and I was only black. And I had the program director and the owner tell me, now this is after. In Philadelphia. In Philadelphia. Uh, we're getting too many calls and letters because this is before social media. Uh, you're talking about black folk too much. And, and so, <laughs> you know, you know me. So the next day I, I decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to interview two people, different viewpoints. So it was Ron Brown, because he was running to be chairman of the DNC, mm -hmm. the first black chairman. So I had Ron Brown on one hour. And then the next hour, I interviewed Louis Farrakhan. <laughs> I was gone. <laughs> And, and, uh, you say y'all want to see black? And and then when I came to uh, you know then and then <laughs> when I came, and and then and you and you oh now I'm, I'm re and all of this is in the book so I'm doing a, a TV that Geraldo was this is when the hey the first beginning of talk radio right and 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 there was this argument about black folk black folk and 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 uh, talk radio but there weren't a lot of black folk and the program director of WABC, uh, Geraldo asked him legitimately, why don't you have any black folk on, 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 in a New York and you don't have a single black person? Uh, and he said, oh, well, we have to think about it. And then somebody spoke up and said, well, you do have a black person. And I can't remember the man's name now. And he said, oh, well, we don't think of him as black. And and, and that debate is what sort of got me into Washington uh, and because the program director said, well, if they don't want you in Philly, we want you in Washington. Mm -hmm. But I did say this. I'm not going here and replacing another black. See, they have one black person. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and uh, I said, so if you're going to hire me and fire her, then I don't want the job because I'm not going to play that game. Right. Um, 
this is, and you know, it's, it's about sacrifice. And then take your platform, and, and you do this all the time. Go to a war zone in Sudan. I, I swear, I ask, and Geraldo can be upset if he wants to. I've been in that war in South Sudan for, had gone back and forth at least six times. I kept asking people who had more resources than I had, come with me. Mm -hmm. I mean, he asked me, well, can we get in and out of South Sudan in a day? Uh, what hotel are we going to stay in? Excuse me, we're sleeping in the bush. It's a war going on. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, you know, he just walked away. He just walked away. And I think at the time he was with AB, ABC. And then I've had some brothers who I've asked to go with me. And, and, they, and they, well, they would say, well, there's a war going on. You don't see the folks at CNN. Everybody's clamoring to get over there mm -hmm. at, at, because there's a war uh, going on. And the other final thing I wanted people to understand in the book was people tend to look at us as we are now. Right. They see you. They say, oh, man, he's got a nice suit on. Brother, I was not born with this suit right, on. Right, right. I always say, no, everybody want to talk about Bishop T.D. Jakes today. They don't want to talk about when he was, when he was digging ditches in West Virginia. Or, or when I was, and when I was 10, year, 10 years old, my grandfather hauled trash. That's how he made a living. Separated metals, paper, and I worked with him. In those days, they called it a dump. Today, it's a landfill. <laughs> and that's how I spent my summers. That's how I made my money in my summer. So in the book, I talk about going from working and, and my grandfather saying to me, you don't like this, do you? What is there to like? No, hell no, I don't <laughs> like this. And he said, well, then, then you got two choices. And that is you either go to the military, and those days he said to Army, or you, uh, you go to college. But come 18, you're getting out of here. And, and I always, and I didn't talk about in the book that I go from working in a dump to interviewing the first black president of the United States in the Oval Office. Um, and so I just want people to understand uh, that uh, none of us in this business, first, all of us in this business have to use our platform. And right. that's what you were talking about all this, this evening. Yeah. You got to use, everybody can do something. And that's been my, 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 my mantra. No matter who you are, Everybody can do something. I can't do what you do. This place is, I mean, I wish people could see where I am. This is magnificent. Man, you ought to be renting this out to, to, to all kinds of folks. But everybody. That, that, that's on the list. But everybody can do something. The, the thing that, you talked about being talk radio. And the general public really doesn't think about this how white folks absolutely dominate talk radio. Oh, yes. But not just talk radio, sports talk radio. Oh. And so mm -hmm. how people, and I, I tell people all, all, all the time, the, the media is the second most powerful institution in the world. First being? Mil guns, okay. the military. Yeah. Get the guns. Any coup is guns first, yeah. media second. Mm -hmm. and, you're, and, and just what you said is what you do with it. So... You've seen other folks and how they frame stories and how they talked about stories and how they've talked about individuals. Uh, the, the white loud Republican, how he dog and Phyllis Randall. No, no, we're going to have Phyllis on. And again, yeah. it's, it's, it's framing. And I tell people all the time, you cannot ignore the reality of how powerful media is in shaping the hearts and minds of the public. That's right. And the other thing, I I'll talk about, and that is, and this is what makes <laughs> your show so fascinating and popular. You hear me say, put it where the goats can get it. Yeah, I tell people that all around the country. And, I said, as Joe Madison says, put it where the goats now, can get it. Now, that, that is, an, I came, you know, and I'm kind of intimidated with all these distinguished professors. <laughs> 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 I mean, I am absolutely, especially my man from Howard. Look oh, at great, great. Great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I am. But let me tell you, let me tell you, I came back from college <laughs> and I believe it was a Thanksgiving dinner. My grandfather, Clarksdale, Mississippi, no more than a sixth grade education, wasn't because he was dumb. It was just what it was. Jim Crow days. as well, Jim yeah. Crow, Jim Crow. And I'm trying to wax eloquently. 
about what I, this philosophy teacher and data. My grandfather looked, he, he said, Joseph, why don't you put it where the goats can get it? <laughs> and I said, what, what the hell is he talking about? It's an old country saying, goats eat down to the root. They go beyond the top and they go all the way down. And he said, if you can explain it to me so that I understand it, I imagine that teacher with a PhD would probably understand too. Right. And that's, this is what irritates me about all of these talking heads that, you know, that, that uh, you see on, on news shows is they, you know, I just wish they would just plain, just, we, somebody used to say, explain it to me like I'm in the second yeah, grade. it's real basic. Just basic. We, I mean, we, we used to always cross paths uh, during Lou Dobbs' show when he was sane. Uh, when he was at CNN. People don't believe, but at one point right. he well, was sane. Lou, Lou Dobbs was yeah. absolutely sane. Yeah, right, then he right. had a lobotomy and he lost his damn mind. Actually, it was talk radio that actually changed him. Yes, it was. It, it was the, when he well, got I, that I, radio show. He, when he got that contract with that radio. <laughs> yeah, but that was it, because when he got the radio show, it was yeah. around the same time that Rush Limbaugh signed for 100 million. Yes. And Lou, that's what caused Lou to lose his damn mind. So we, we used to always do these shows together, and, and you're absolutely right. One of the things that made me so popular on CNN, I told it straight. That's right. I mean, I wasn't sitting here, and, and, and it, was a, it was a trip because they tried to change my wardrobe. Really? They, oh, yeah, absolutely. They tried to change. Uh, they always wanted, you know, this is how we do it. I said, whoa, let me explain something to y'all. I ain't them. I remember sitting on the set one day, and Joe, Joe, Joel Klein with Time Magazine, and we're sitting there, and someone said something. I said, Man, I ain't him. I said, first of all, look at him. I said, he got dirt on his jacket. He wearing some khaki pants, this boring ass blue shirt. I said, I don't know about y'all, but shit, I'm clean. That ain't me. I said, I ain't gonna never look like him. So I don't care what that, cause they used to, they, cause I used to have a clothes rack that was in my office. I had suits, I had shirts, I had cufflinks, and I would be on the air daytime and nighttime. And they would go, you wouldn't change clothes. I said, oh, a brother can't wear the same thing in prime time. He wore in daytime. So they, they were always trying to figure mm -hmm. out. I said, y'all, I'm going to do me. That's right. And I mm -hmm. understood the mm -hmm. audience, how to speak to the audience. And the reason that that thing I knew was a trip, 2008, the debates had already been scheduled. The first two debates, I had speeches. I wasn't, on, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't in studio. Yeah, I heard you say that. And mm -hmm. we, we lost the first two debates, CBS. So the third debate, I had another speech. I get, mm -hmm. I'm flying from speech, mm -hmm. the, pres the president worldwide calls me. I get a voicemail. Hey, Roland, it's Jim. Buddy, nothing urgent, give me a call uh, when you can. Hmm. When, when the worldwide CEO call you mm -hmm. and say nothing urgent, you know it's urgent. Yeah, you know it. That's so funny. I knew exactly what mm -hmm. I saw. I called my agent, Mark Watson, and said, Mark, we probably gonna have to move that speech next week, I think. Uh, he, oh, he, he's telling me we need you. And then when I called him, he said, uh, we need you on set. Right. Mm -hmm. So I go on set and they got, that's when they had them huge panels. So they had about 10 of us up there. Uh, it was, no, it was nine. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was eight panelists. It was, it was not, it was, yes, it was nine panelists. It was two anchors. They had eight seats. I was like, so I'm standing up. Like, well. And I was like, who could be the first black person to see me, who called me or sent me an email about me standing up? It was Spike Lee. Black man can't get a chair? <laughs> <laughs> so when the night was over, I was like, yo, what, what the hell was up with that? They said, oh, no, no, no. We, we, wanted, it, we wanted everybody to see that you were here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's what they told yeah. me. Yeah. That's <laughs> when, again, that's when you understand yeah. how you have, have an impact on people. And it's who you're communicating with. You have been doing that. But serious is one thing, but talk about, again, being in D.C. and dealing and talking just regular, ordinary folk, the folk like your grandfather, and how they have a commitment to say, we're going to ride with you, Joe. We got your back no matter what happens. Well, I, I, I think you get to a certain point where they just can't deny you. you look, they know you're professional. They, and, and I think there's the other issue, I, I'll say this, they know you'll walk out the door. I, I mean, I'll, I, I, I will walk out the door. Um, can I add something, though, let, not yeah, to get ahead, off that ahead. point? 
I, you were talking about Jackie Robinson. I think the piece you did was superb. Um, I, I wanted to remind everybody that this summer, Rachel Robinson is going to be 100 yep. years old. Indeed. And if you're going to talk about Jackie Robinson, you've got to talk about Rachel Robinson. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll say this. This may tick a lot of people off. I said it yesterday at a George Washington University. They have a Jackie Robinson project that they won't fund. The university won't fund it. They mm. have to raise their own money. <laughs> and and, and um, I said yesterday, you know, Maybe if Will Smith had just stopped and paused for a moment and thought about Jackie Robinson and what was said to Rachel in those stands, they called her everything but a child of God. And I said, and he had a bat in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And maybe he just should have thought about Jackie Robinson mm. and, what, and, what, what, and, and what was said about him and the woman he was married to until the day he, he died. Now, I know there's an argument about who should have slapped who or not slapped and that kind of thing. Um, and I personally also think that there ought to be curriculum in every college about Jackie Robinson's legacy, because it was more than just baseball. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know? I mean, you read his book, I Never Had It Made. He was a uh, business person. And, I mean, these professors, the professors know better and was than hard, and, and was hardcore and challenged his own Republican Party. And, and there's another issue, too, I've, I've been hit, hitting on. Fort Hood, you know, you know, they, they, you know, you know now, first of all, well, he was court-martialed. There is an effort and a petition to change the name of Fort Hood to the Jack, Jackie Robinson base. Really? Yes. Look it up. That, and, and by the way, so let's start with who was Hood. He was a Confederate general. He was a Confederate general who, by the way, quit the military. <laughs> so I want the audience out there to go look it up. And I think that's one of the next things that they, since they're talking about changing the names of these bases. And one of the hardest things to find is the TNT movie where Andre Breyer played Jackie Robinson. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called The Court Martial of Jackie Robinson. It, it, I have been, you cannot find that anywhere. Yeah. I remember watching it. Uh, and I, it may be still on VHS tape, but not even on DVD. I got some other questions. I'm going to bring in the panelists oh. here now. So they can oh, ask that. Oh, really? So they can, so they ask oh, man. You, you, see, you didn't tell me. No, you didn't tell me. No, I got to take, I gotta, yeah, yeah, I gotta take an exam from you. Yeah, 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 you do. So I, well, I ain't going to go to the professor first. Because uh, we're we going we gonna to ease into it. So uh, the cusser, the chief cusser oh, really? on Rolling My Unfiltered, who's also a contributor on Sirius XM, the Clay Kane show, uh, Reese Colbert. Reese, your question for Joe Madison. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction and dubbing me the princess of cussing. Um, Joe Madison, it's such an honor to uh, be in company with you on this show. So thank you for blessing us with so many gems. Uh, a question that I have for you is, you know, now I feel like news in our society and our attention span moves so fast. Um, you have such a long career. And I'm just curious, does it did it feel like that? in the other kind of historic and significant errors that we've been through, that things were moving fast and it was easily forgotten? Or does it feel a little bit different? Like we have to, you know, push harder to really, um, you know, uh, get people to, 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 to see the gravity and, 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 the, and the momentous um, part of what we are experiencing. I, and and I, I have to apologize. Putting I, into context, I didn't this, hear the first put, part. Putting into context this moment, this right. moment that we're in, right. all the different things that are going on. Uh, how does it compare to other uh, eras uh, that when you've been on? Oh, nothing. Nothing has uh, really changed other than the characters, uh, and 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 also the means of communicating is 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 a lot faster. Uh, I think the reality is. Uh, war is war, uh, you know, inflation is inflation. Um, black folk have always uh, had to survive, as, as Roland and all of you were explaining the first part of the show. Um, the, the, they're, you know, these, the, these, it's something 
maybe the best way to put it, like putting it where the goats can get it, um, it it's, it's, it's Jim Crow's sophisticated cousin. I always refer to him as James Crow Esquire. Same, same attempts to maintain white supremacy, no if, ands, buts about it. It's just more sophisticated. Um, um, and they've learned a few tricks, mm -hmm. um, but the reality is, is that it's, it's just sophisticated. And, and we have to do more reading, we have to do more researching, and, and, and I also say this, it's, again, in the book, Radioactive, <clears throat> it's cultural conditioning. Now, what do I mean by cultural conditioning? And you've been, cult you've been saying this all morning, all evening long. America is culturally conditioned to believe that white is superior, black is inferior, and the manifestation of that cultural conditioning is that blacks are undervalued, underestimated, and marginalized. That's the, and some of us are culturally conditioned That's right. to believe, to undervalue, underestimate, yep. and marginalize ourselves. When you were talking about the monarchs, you can have both monarchs and blacks in, in major league. I mean, uh, uh, but we have to recondition That's right. our culture. And culture is See, the for heart. For me, I, I say reprogram. Yeah, yeah, yeah but it's the same right. thing. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and yes. culture is the hardest thing to change. Yeah. And on any, on any, on any, in any country, Culture is the most difficult thing but see, to change. But see, what you said about when you talked about uh, if Will had stopped and thought about Jackie Robinson, mm -hmm. it's about being intentional. Just what I was saying, when I was picking shoes, I could have said, oh, I'm going to wear a white pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. red. No, no, no. I'm going to specifically wear those because they're black-owned company. That, that means stopping yourself, thinking it through, taking that moment, thinking it through, and no. I'm wearing these for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens is, you're at, we're, right, we, we, we have gotten, first of all, I tell people all the time, we have to really not appreciate, but understand how powerful white supremacy was mm -hmm. in terms of how it's so deeply ingrained into our psyche and white folks that, yeah, we can look at something, and I get it all the time where someone is like, yeah, but we go get you a real show. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, what exactly. the hell is it? Which means real? Oh, let me tell you. And about they really, and they really yeah. mean white. Yeah, I, I, I have a chapter in the book where I talk about people always ask, "How did you get the, 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 the handle Black Eagle?" And when I first started using that handle, folks went crazy on the radio. I mean, these white people went nuts. Now the owner, the managers didn't, because what are they going? They're going to tell me I can't say it. Um, <laughs> And, and, um, <laughs> and let me tell how it came about. Um, I was following Oliver North. We're in a meeting with a talk show consultant who was bragging about Oliver North. Oliver North had never done talk radio before. Oh, he's the Captain Kirk of this, good, good sh this enterprise ship. And I said, well, what are we? We're not oatmeal. I mean, what are we? And, uh, you know, he brushed me off. So I got, I left the meeting and got in the car with Dick Gregory. <laughs> and I said, you know what? I think I'm going to start calling myself the Black Eagle. I'm, it's, I'm in Washington. Right. National Bird is the Eagle. And he, I said, but have you ever heard of a Black Eagle? He said, no, but I think tomorrow morning we're going to be hearing about it. <laughs> but guess, guess what happened? I find then it, God is it, fate. Uh, I'm looking at National Geographic, and they do a special on eagles. And the biggest, largest bird, eagle species, is a black eagle. <laughs> wow. And, none, and, you know, and then you would have folks call in, white folks call in and say, well, if you the black eagle, I'm the uh, white pigeon. And I said, well, just remember, eagles eat pigeons. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I just think you, 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 you have to be original, you have to be right. authentic, and you have to be daring. 
Yep. That is, and you know who told me that was Aretha Franklin. Mm, the queen. Yeah, because when you hear Aretha Franklin, you, that's who you hear, and you know it. Yeah. And remember, she wasn't a big success when she first started out because she was doing other people's... She was doing covers. Covers. When she decided to be authentic... There you go. That's when she became uh, uh, a hit. That's, there you go. That's why, and I say this, and that's why I consider you a brother and a friend. You're authentic. And people need to understand that. You are authentic. And, and, the, and folks just don't like it, just got to get used to it. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever. Terrain. Terrain. Terrain Walker. First of all, Joe, it's an honor and a privilege to be in the same space with you, first of all. Uh, this is amazing. Um, my question to you is, well, there has always been a history with um, black um, entertainers and black reporters and black radio people where they were the voices of the, they were basically the voices of the community and they were able to interpret um, world events to the community. And my question to you is, um, do you feel like some of that legacy uh, has been lost? How can we bring that back? How can we revitalize the idea of black people like yourself, like Roland being the reals for the community and interpreting black communities to the world and the world of black people? We all, we've always had, did, we've always had in, in, in these cities, in each one of these cities, you mm -hmm. had you had a black eagle. You had that that voice. Yes. It could be a DJ, it could be yes. a talk show host, yes. could be a columnist. Uh, and what Duran is there was, is, there it, was it, a congressman during Reconstruction period. He was known as the black uh, the black eagle. Yeah, go and ahead. And you see, in many ways, I think what Duran is saying is we've lost that. And so how do we how do we bring that back where we have these these voices that, to your point, that are that, that are sacrificing for the collective, and, and I'll, I'll add to what you said, Terrain, who are not all about getting them the check, but is really about representing the people in the community. I, in, in, you know, in, I, it, I don't know how to answer that. I really honestly don't know. I think that's maybe one of the reasons I did the memoir, is what, what made you? What, what made you? Um, you know, my, my grandfather, working with my grandfather in the trash truck. What made you? Uh, was my, my uh, minister at St. Margaret's Church, who was a brilliant man. What made you? It was a, uh, a, a, a football coach who, by the way, my first football uh, experience, I got kicked off the team because I was active in, in large part in the black student movement. This is, and, and some of you may know this, and that is we were, just, we were trying to get black studies on mm. these campuses. Uh, you know, brothers are getting kicked off the football teams around, go read, read this, around the country because they wore afros or because there was a black student movement and ball players were looked up to. And if you walked around campus, maybe with a black band as part of the protest, uh, the coach would call you in and say, you take that black band or you lose your scholarship. And some folks wouldn't do it and they'd sacrifice their, their, their scholarship. I, that's the best way that I can, can answer it. Our, pers our perspective is, is what creates us. And, uh, and, and our experience creates our perspective. And so I guess it was all the things I went through. And that's why it was a challenge writing this book, because I had to go back. And the editor kept saying, well, why did this happen? Why did that happen? And, uh, and, 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 and so it's based on your experience. Why are you the way you are? Why are the, these professors the way they are? And, and what and makes you you? What, I, make, yeah. I, I, what I, makes I, you I, you? The, the way I would answer what, what Terrain asked yeah. is this way. I am who I am today because there was a black newspaper that I worked for. Mm, mm -hmm. John Ware was a former city manager of Dallas. He left to become this, he left to run a billion dollar investment firm fun for Tom Hicks, a uh, big private equity guy, later bought the Texas Rangers. And when I was, when I was at Tom Jones, blackamericanweb.com, and I was, I, I, it was, and, and then when I got fired from there and I was sitting here trying to do some other stuff, right. and I would call John, I would call John. 
And this is what John always said. He said, Roland, it doesn't matter. Just get a platform that you control. Mm -hmm. So the way we do that terrain, we have to create yes. the platforms. Right. I, so when I launched this show, it was never going to only be me. Mm -hmm. The moment I launched, I said, I'm going to be the tent pole. I'm going to be the axis. And so the people who I bring on, then that's going to then create who stands out, create a show for them. So now Faraji has a daily show. He, here was Faraji, a 25-year-old young brother from Baltimore coming on my TV One show. And I was like, all right, well, he got something. He got something. And then I created Faraji, we're going to do this daily show. Mm -hmm. And so bring him on. And then uh, Greg, mm, you know, Greg, I'm thinking about this here. And this is, but that wasn't even a Black Star Network. And even before Greg was doing what he's doing with Karen Hunter, we were talking about, okay, I'm a, we create this, but I got to build this first. Well, yeah. And then my wife's show, and then what Deborah Owens is doing, and then there are four or five other shows. Right. People been hit me, Roland, uh, what a Reese show. I'm like, calm down, <laughs> y'all. Like, calm down. I got a plan. Everybody chill. But that's really it. If we don't build the ecosystem terrain, yeah. you, then you're not going to have the voices because there has to be a place where who owns it gives you the freedom to develop your voice, right. cultivate your voice, cultivate your rhythm, right. your tone, all those different things. That takes time, and you ain't going to get it over there. It was Jonathan Rogers. I, everybody, this is no disrespect. It was not Kathy Hughes. It was not Alfred Liggins. It was Jonathan Rogers, who was the founding CEO of TV One, who said, I'm trying. going to put you on, America needs to hear your voice, but we got to get the network built first. Jonathan got Somebody. the job and called me. Yeah. He called Royal, his wife first, called me. TV One wasn't even named, but he told me that, but I had to be patient. Same thing. That's, what, that's how I got developed. Same thing happened in, with the Sirius XM. Um, I was on WOL, Radio One, and satellite radio was created. Mm -hmm. They did not have uh, a, a black talk nope. platform. Did not have one. And Nate Davis, brilliant. He mm -hmm. was president. Yeah. He went, and no one thought that satellite radio would take off. You remember that? Nate Davis, y'all black. And, and, yeah, yeah. and Nate Davis, brilliant, just as quiet. And, and he, said, he said, you know what? We need this channel. Because, you know, Sirius is like, I always look at it, it's like a bookstore. Yeah. And, and if you don't like what's on channel 26 or 126, go over. go over to another, you know, I think, I forget how many channels there are. So it's like if you don't like this, sec what, this book in this section, then go to another section. Yeah. And Nate Davis came to me and said, you know, we have got to have uh, a, this a, a platform like, and initially it was the power. Right. Now, I, they know how I feel about that. It should have stayed the power. But, you know, some brother came on and said, well, I don't, I don't person. like news and, you know, and, and the power sounds so 60-ish. And I'm blowing him out, but that's okay. And say, let's change it to urban, of urban view. First of all, I hate, I, hate, I hate when they slap urban on anything. I'm like, just say black shit. Stop, don't, don't. Yeah. I, I hate, I hate, oh, dude, I can't. But, oh, I, but, can't but wait I can't stand when they throw urban but, in it or soul. But wait a minute, you got, you got, you got, uh, you got the Patriots channel. Right. So that's the right wingers. You've got, uh, 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 what is it, Progress. Right. And that's the, the liberal channel. The, basically the liberal. Yeah, the POTUS channel. You, uh, uh, po politics of the United Nations. Now, why can't you, and I've argued this, why can't you have uh, the, 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 the black channel with the, all these brilliant minds you have and call it the power. And, and, and so what I've been told is, you know, it is what it is now. You guys are really popular, so don't change it. And I'm saying, okay, I'm still going to cuss. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Dr. Greg Carr. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm really intimidated now. Oh, no. God.
<laughs> it's the it's the opposite, Baba. I tell you, man, I could just sit here and listen to you all all night. I want to add my honor and respect to giving to you, uh, like Reese and Terrain said. Every time that I've been around you and seen you, it's just an honor, brother. Sometimes to shake your hand and stand there and listen. Um, I remember the first time I saw your studio in Sirius XM in DC. I went down to, uh, to do Leon, Wilma Leon's show on the weekend. We walked by, I said, that's where the Black Eagle sits. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. But you know, I, I guess my question is very broad and it kind of echoes what Reese was asking, uh, Brother Madison. And I, and I know my old classmate, Dave Canton, probably gave you hell because he, like me, is an academic and tried to yeah. put words in your mouth and you had to get him straight. But he says in the beginning of your book there, Radioactive, he says, you know, you always remind us to listen with our third ear. Right. And, and so looking forward, and you and Roland are really talking about this, but I wonder what you see with your third eye, what you hear with your third ear about the future of media generally. I don't know if radio will ever be displaced. I mean, we grew up, we all grew up on radio. Hearing your voice got us through many a challenge in our community. But I wonder, as you're looking forward uh, with uh, legacy media seemingly coming apart at the seams, you know, what do you see in terms of breaking through all the noise and really capturing the, the imagination of our people, particularly as it relates to information? And thank you for your continuing work, Bob. With this, this, whole, this whole piece about listening with the third ear and reading with the third eye, that came from a, a older politician. I remember the ride from Detroit to Lansing. He was a state senator. And he said, look, young man, I was just brand new running the NACP. And he said, the best of, of uh, what's his name, Will Rogers. Will Rogers? He said, yes, there's a book out, read the best of Will Rogers. Now, who is Will Rogers? Will Rogers was like the Johnny Carson of his, of his day on radio. Uh, you know, he, he was the one that would say, you know, poly, uh, Congress is the uh, second oldest profession. I mean, and people would listen to him. Oh, the homespun. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, but political humor. Yeah. He, he, he was, uh, but, uh, now... The other thing he said was, listen with a third ear and read with a third eye. See, and so the, to answer your question, too often and we take what we see and not realize what's really being done in the, in the background. That's that third eye that you, that you see. What is that news story? What's really behind that news story? So again, what again? Yeah, radio will always be around. I, I think it was a point in time where I I, I think we used to say whenever uh, there would people would take over a country, there would be a revolution. First thing they take over is the radio station. Yeah, yeah. After the military, I mean, it's media. They, they, yeah, they take over the radio station, and, and we see that radio work. station, newspapers. And so, so here's where I think it's going, and that is everybody now is a potential communicator. Yep. Right with this. Everybody now is a so, and we're seeing it. Yep. Like the story out of uh, out of Michigan yep. this, the, the, where that Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids. The, and you know, think this this guy the passenger became a reporter. There you go. He pulled he pulled that a young girl in, that's, in Minnesota. That's, that's why that's why I give lessons on the air saying uh, Shoot horizontal, please, so it fills the whole screen up. Yeah. Don't shoot vertical. Yeah, we get okay. the black bars. I tell everybody, yeah. shoot video, shoot like this. Now, the other thing is, <laughs> yep. is that, and, and I know folks like to criticize the younger generation, but I tell you, you know, I did my, my hunger strike, and folks thought it was crazy. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 I knew what I was doing because Dick Gregory and I used to, and he taught me how to do it. And he taught me why you do it. You do it to get attention. Right. You get it to shake, to get the, the people. Now, we didn't get the legislation because we had two Democratic senators that just were traitors to, to our, our cause. But you know what we did? We woke up a younger generation. They now know what a filibuster rule is. They now know how Congress works. Young folk went on hunger strikes mm -hmm. that, that you know you they wouldn't you couldn't get them to pass a, a, a fast food place. Uh, they realized we have to make sacrifices. We woke up a generation, 
And, and, and doctor, I will say this to you, and, I'll, and I say this with all due respect. Quit talking about passing the torch. Now, I'll tell you why. I'm not going to pass my torch. I'm going to hold on to my torch. I'll light your torch. Right. So because, right. Be, because if I pass my torch on to you, I'm in the dark. Mm. <laughs> right. I'm in the dark. See, I, see I, 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 use the, I, I use the relay example. You know right, say, thank you. You're in the relay. This is what I explain to people. But you got to keep, keep running, though. Right. First, okay. of all, first of all, right. You're running at the same time they're running. Right. When you st stick it out, they have, they have to reach back. And there's a point when yeah. both of you are holding the baton at the very same That's time. Right. Yeah. And then you got to let that baton and, go. And, and that generation has to run faster than we did. There you go. So the thing, so the th what, so what I what, what I tell folks, I, I've always hated that phrase too. Even when I was 20, 30, I hated that phrase because what it said to a lot of people is, oh, I, 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 I'm, I'm just gonna sit here and do nothing. Uh, I, I wish y'all all people get out of the way. I had, I, and I, I, we were on. I will never forget. It was after Trayvon Martin, at the Zimmerman decision, he's found not guilty, and folks were just they, they were shocked. I, I never forget that. I never forget the night. It was a Saturday night. Deltas had their, their national convention here. I was actually at their step show, and the thing that just circulated. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, probably about 800 people from around the world who were on the phone. The next night, it was like 2,000 people who were on the phone. People just wanted to talk. It was interesting. They, they had no place to, they, they were like, they wanted to go to some place to convene. Mm -hmm. It basically turned to a talk, talk show. Mm -hmm. But what was a trip is that, so a group of black folks, folks 20, 30, 40s, uh, started convening and was very interesting. And so we were, we were on these calls and and one of the things, Joe, by really smart people, they really smart people don't sometimes know how to slow down. So they're sitting here and they was like, we call for do this and do that and this and this and the website it was going on and on. And so Jeff Johnson and I were chilling. Jeff goes, folks, I'm just curious, who are we targeting? Who do we say we're speaking for? So Jeff and I, we started communicating on this deal. So that was this young lady uh, who uh, hit Jeff, and he, she, she was like, oh, you know, I, I'm just, I, I don't, I'm tired of these old heads like rolling my, why is he on the call? Mm. And Jeff said, he said, let me ask you a question. You think he arrogant? He was like, and? He said, but who else on the call has a national platform? Yeah, exactly. He said, he the only yeah. one. And then he said, who else on this call if we needed somebody to kick off what we were doing and put $10,000 on the table, who could do it and not blink? Yeah. He, uh, he said him. He said, why in the hell would you not want that person at the table? Yeah. That's part of that whole thing yeah. with this folk fighting and who I don't want in the room. I'm like, hey, if you got something to contribute, gotcha. we all can be. We all can Everybody can do something. Everybody. Look, Rosa Parks lit my torch. Uh, in the book, we talk about, her, we boycott, let me tell you, we boycotted the city of Dearborn. Yes. Uh, and because a, a issue with a park. Uh, Dearborn is not the Dearborn you know now. Right. It was a, 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 a sundown town and a dusted sundown. And the black population was less than 1%. Some black folk, here's Dearborn, here's Detroit. You cross the street, you're in Dearborn. Some folks went over and got into a, went to a park shelter. People had, came in and said, well, you can't, these are, this is Dearborn Park. You can't have this, it was a public park. You can't use this shelter. And lo and behold, uh, we're reading the, again, the newspaper. A good friend of mine, uh, we, he worked at John Conyers' office. Rosa Parks worked there. And he said, we got to do something about this. This is a public park. So we got together and said, okay, fine. We'll boycott the city of Dearborn. So, you know, uh, uh, they had a huge regional mall. Folks, black folks were spending their money. We did. And Rosa Parks said, I'll join you. Oh, okay. And so we decided, uh, we took a, a, a lesson from, from uh, uh, Randall Robinson and the boycott, uh, the, the boycott of the South African embassy. Mm -hmm. We did it the day before Thanksgiving. Why? 
media. Why? You know why. Because Thanksgiving Day was going to be a slow news day. Mm -hmm. So Rosa Parks and Joe Madison gets arrested in Dearborn, calls for a boycott. 70%, it was instantaneous. It was spontaneous. People stopped shopping the next, that, what they call now Black Friday. Right. They stopped. Let me tell you who gave me more hell than anybody in Dearborn. The older black leadership. You did not get my permission to call a boycott. I was, because Henry Ford called all of the black leaders. Now, Coleman Young was mayor, and, and there were some powerful black folk. I'm just a young 20 something NACP executive. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, I wasn't even with, it. yeah, I was on the, the political uh, department at the time. Yeah, because I was uh, uh, with uh, Ben Hooks. They called me into a meeting. This was a Saturday morning. They have eggs, bourbon, and, and you know, that, that one of those meetings, like a kitchen cabinet. And there were some powerful folk. There was a federal judge. There was a mayor. There was a labor leader. Man, these were, these were some, these were older brothers. Right. And they said, you know, you remind me of myself when I was your age. But young man, this is Coleman Young, you got to, you know, you, you didn't get my permission to call this boycott, and you got Henry Ford pissed off at me, and da 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 da. And I said, Mary Young, with all due respect, I didn't think I needed your permission to call a boycott, and I have it in the book. He looked me in the eye and said, boy, you need my permission to fart in this city. <laughs> but you know what? You can't stop it. Right. It's already happened. Too late. It's too late. You got to call it off. And they tried to pressure us to call it off. Mm -hmm. It was too late. And the lesson I learned was boycotts are successful one of two ways. And Ben Hooks taught me this. They're either spontaneous or they're well planned. There you go. And he told this group of folks who wanted me out of the city, um, we know it wasn't well planned because <laughs> y'all didn't help him. And he pulled me out of one of these meetings and said, no, he's not, because they, they said, get him out of town. And he said, he's not going anywhere. Come mm. on. He stood me up and said, come on, we're leaving. This yes. is, and, and by the way, this is what young people need to understand. It's never been kumbaya. Never. It, we've always, you know, Dr. King wouldn't go on the freedom, uh, the bus rides, on mm -hmm. the freedom rides, because he thought it was dangerous. Kennedy said, talk him out of it, right. talk John Lewis out of it. And they say we're still going. Yeah, and, and that's why all of this is in the book, and that's why it's radioactive. And I got that, I got to give credit to Ron Daniels. Our brother Ron Daniels, he said, you know, you you just radioactive. <laughs> and I always, I always remember that from the good professor. We're going to go seven more minutes. I know we're over. We're going to only go seven more minutes. See, I'm when you have, have your own show, you can do that. I, that's true. That's true. But I'm also, but, and also, uh, you paying off. I got to pay overtime. Oh, so oh, I'm going to okay. do this. So I'm, the panel, you're going to have another question. But I'm, I'm going to ask, ask a couple of first. First, who black gave you the most difficulty interviewing them? Where they were like just getting on your damn nerves and you had to just like, where it got contentious, it got hot. Nobody. Who, so was there no, anybody, any, no. was, did, you, did you have any interview where it, mm -hmm. where it, where it, it, it was, it was a battle. It was, it was a Not, You know, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but I can't, I can't think of anybody like you said, who was black. Um, no, I, I really can't think of, of uh, anybody. One of the things I always do, and you know why this is important, I always prepare. Mm -hmm. I've known you for de you know, decades. I still prepare when I come, I, you know, because I, the one thing is true about the Roland Martin show, I don't know what he's going to ask. I don't know what attitude he's got. I don't know what Roland took out of this book. 
<laughs> and and so, but you know, I have to be prepared now. And I say this because I, I got to tell you, I've had some di difficulties in w with elected officials that really piss me off because they want the questions in advance, right? And and mm -hmm. you got to stick to uh, these questions in advance. I'm not going to give you the questions in advance. First of all, I don't always know. I have a set of questions. The staff. You know, Sherry, uh, my wife is the executive producer. Sam Nassau, they 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 put questions together, and sometimes I'll use those questions as a springboard. But Larry King taught me something, and that was that the the next question is always based on the last there you answer. Go. Absolutely, and that's and 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 I'm not a journalist. We use I use journalistic techniques, right? right. But I'm not a journalist, so I always tell elected officials, uh, especially, uh, don't you know, don't don't treat me like I'm a with CNN or. A matter of fact, you ought to do what Trump learned how to do. Trump knew how to use uh, 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 all all those folks over at Fox. Yep. They, they they and they'll tell you they're not journalists. Right. If anything, they're advocates. No, oh, absolutely. And yeah. and 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 what do you what do you, what do you have here? You know, you've got you've got folks who are journalists, but they also are advocates. There you go. You there know. You go. Yeah. I mean, so that's that's how I would answer. I I, I really don't think any. I got a few. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, who did you interview that you fanned out? You would just. You, you're a professional, but man, you were a fan and to sit across from them and get to talk to them and interview. Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks. Really, Rosa Parks. And, and, and that's like asking them your favorite child. Um, because she was just so honest in her answers. She didn't have to, she's at that stage in her life, there's no pretense. I don't have to impress you, young man. Uh, I'll tell you another person, Barry Gordy. Um, you know, mm. I, I'm a Motown guy. And um, Barry Gordy, just honest, straight up answers about all these folks that uh, uh, that uh, that I've come to admire, mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you somebody else who I became a big fan of, Michelle Obama. Mm. I mm. I've interviewed the you know I tell the story in the, in the book about uh, they called me uh, the president would like you to would you mind doing an interview with the president it was midterm mm -hmm. Republicans are going to take over the the, the Senate and the and the House. And I said, sure. And so what time do you want us to place the call? Oh, no, we want you to come into the Oval Office. Oh, excuse me, this is radio. I'm not bringing it. I don't have a TV camera. But I, I, I knew what the game was. I'm going to bring Joe Madison into the Oval Office. Mm -hmm. It's radio. We could have done this by phone. Right. Oh, and by the way, Brother Madison, Joe, let's sit right here right. where... All the world leaders sit. We have a photograph of it in the book with the fireplace. That's when I look at this fireplace, I'm reminded. Hey, Greg, of that. I ain't get that call. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and the one right. thing I learned, the one thing I learned. So how much? And they said, well, you only have, you only have, uh, what was it, uh, ten minutes? Right, right. right. Something with the president. Now I and never. He, and he was always long-winded. Well, and I never interviewed the, a president of the United States. So I went to a friend of mine. And I said, I only got 10 minutes. I, he'll, he'll, it takes him 10 minutes to answer one right. question. And, and this person reminded me of something. This is what I remind everybody. He said, Joe, forget that. That's staff time. Right. He'll tell you when his time is up. Yep. Man, we went for 25 minutes. There you go. Now, twenty five minutes. Now, was that so? Now, now was now that, was that was that interview September or October twenty ten? October. Okay. So, and, and let me tell you what. Let me. But here's the funny joke. If, so we get to it. We're we're in, now into the interview, and I hear this. Woof, 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 it's the helicopter coming, and to Marine One, and it lands outside. And he stops the interview. He says, "Oh man, Joe." 
brother, I got, man, I got to stop. My ride has gotten here. <laughs> and you don't want a brother to miss his ride. <laughs> but Michelle Obama is real. No pretense. And she, and, and we just clicked just mm -hmm. like that. You know, because of her experience, her experience is quite different than yeah. his experience. We just related. She and she, she was just, just she put it where the goats could get it. So before I go to parents with questions, so, so, let me tell you how that interview with others happened. With, with who? Oh, okay. Obama in the midterm. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So, Obama gets sworn in January two thousand nine. Right. He's, he's on the Tom Jordan morning show the day before the inauguration. Okay? So we go through all of 2009. Does no black media. Oh, yeah, I remember that. So we get to 2010. When I would do Joiner, I would connect before. And we'd be on before. And so Tom was constantly complaining. How in the hell Michael Steele has been on my show more than the, the president? Yeah. Tom was like, all the stuff I did, all the stuff I... Yeah, and we were so, all going through that, having go. that, that train. So, Hurricane Katrina anniversary is August 2010. Obama does this sit-down interview with Brian Williams. I said, enough of this shit. I sent Barry and Jared an email. I said, y'all gonna have to learn how to come home. I said... We've had Michael Steele on three times. Y'all ain't done Tom, Steve, Joe. I see interviews with everybody. Yeah. I said, we got midterms coming up. We waited all of 09. Here we are, yeah. more than halfway into 2010. Y'all need to be That's talking true. to black, black radio and yeah. black media. That's true. Oh, oh, oh okay, yeah. I got you. That's true. So the next week, he's on Joiner. So they start scheduling them. Yeah. And when he comes on, he apologizes to Tom. You know what? I should have been doing more of this. I should have been here earlier. But I sat there and I said, no. So Tom was trying not. I said, no, no. I'm going to tell her. This don't make any sense. Now, to everybody who's watching, y'all remember when I was going off on speaking to Nancy Pelosi. So let me tell you what happened. So I called Joe. What y'all don't realize, y'all don't understand how, how we work. It's like passing the ball, who gets an assist? Yeah, that's right. Y'all understand. <laughs> like, we, like we did in a Senate meeting uh, with, oh, with the Democratic God, leadership yeah, right. two weeks ago. So I'm telling Joe about how I'm blasting Pelosi every day. Joe's like, shit, hell, they ain't done my show. So I've been asking for years. I see it. So we go on. He said, he said I'm going to support, support you. So the next day, Joe goes on the show, says what I'm doing. Well, Pelosi's people were listening. Phone rings. <laughs> she was on what? 48 hours later? Yeah. Joe called me. Hey, Ro, uh, she's going to be on the show in two days. And I was like, good. She, was, she did April Ryan. April, April came and she's like, Ro, I got to thank you for that. I said, here's my whole deal. I said, I still ain't got an interview. I said, but Joe got her. April got her. I said, but that's the whole point. It's not about your ego. It's, yo, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. Right, right. We, we all in this thing together. We all got to apply that pressure to them to say, don't play us small. And why is that the case? Because we have basically the same audience and the same responsibility right. to educate our audience. That's why. So to, so to Terrain's yeah. question, part of that, how do you create that, that, that group? is you got to have folks who are willing to pass the ball to each other, which is why we talk, which is why we compare notes, which is why if I ain't get Joe, are you getting this here? No, nah, hell no, nah, they ain't coming on. Okay, cool. When I go in, I'm going to say, y'all got to do me and y'all got to do Joe. That, that's the thing that people don't understand. Yeah. Most people don't understand the conversations that we yeah. have before, like before the meeting. Right. And, and so like and, look at him. Yeah, and, and, and that's why I said when we first started. So like when, when you when, hit them about, about Africa, Oh, yeah. We're, what happened? Yeah. I said, hey, Joe, we're going to hit Sudan, Cameroon, Ethiopia. That's right. Give me a name. Roland, put this person on. That's how it happens. Because I had gone to Sudan there you go. With, the, with the brother from uh, South Africa, and he had been begging 
Madison, you've got to get folks talking about the fact right. that seventy percent, seventy percent of the folk in southern and South Sudan are starving to death. But the point is, we who are in with the platforms can't be so selfish when we don't talk no, to each other have to. and work right. with each other. All right, next round of questions. Final round of questions. I know, yes, staff, we're running over time, uh, but trust me, I got some plan, and y'all gonna get over it when y'all experience it. Uh, Reese. Yes, my next question is, you know, you do radio and I'm on the Clay Kane show every Thursday and I really enjoy the call-in aspect of it. Can you just talk a little bit about, you know, how that has influenced your career, having that back and forth on a daily basis and really, you know, how it's helped you move the needle in terms of what Black America is talking well, about? Well, call us. Okay, one of the things that I, I've learned and, and is if I had to do a, a boot camp on talk radio, um, callers can often, first of all, callers should never run your show. It should not be a call-driven show. Um, I don't do open line, uh, and I'll tell you why. Because too often that is meant the, 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 the personality or the broadcaster didn't prepare. And to talk about. And, and I've tried that a couple of times where I said, you know what, y'all take over the show, the callers, y'all call. We got, on social media, we were bombarded. Don't ever do that again. Mm. Um, and, and, and because folk call up, they want to hear your opinion. Mm -hmm. They want to know, they want, they want to, uh, and, and, and then you let callers uh, respond. But um, I, I tell you, I think the worst mistake you can make is to, is to one, uh, let callers take over the show. I think the other mistake you make is what I call frequent callers. Mm. We have a rule on the Madison show, it's one call a week. Mm. Now the reason is, again, I learned this, that if you've got six million people listening to you and you can't fill up nine lines, <laughs> then you're doing, you're doing something wrong. And, and, uh, and, and then what happens is, those, if, I, if I did that and had frequent callers, it'd be the same people right. every single right. day, and they would call in every single yep. day. Yep. Well, that's not necessary now, because we have something called podcasting. So, and that's what I tell them. Uh, if, if, look, this is the Madison show. This isn't uh, Joe Blow's show. And if you, if, you wanna, if you want your show, go do a podcast. And, and there aren't very many successful podcasts. No. Well, what gets me you is know. what gets me is when people. I love these people. Yeah. They hit me yesterday. Uh, why why you keep interrupting the guy? Because I have Be, a very simple rule. Yeah. I can't allow a lie. To Thank be you. Told that's my rule. That's and my rule. Allow it to stand. That's right. Because here's how I say it. You're right. If you're listening to me, and a lie is told, and I don't say anything, you think I just heard the truth. And there's another issue too. You see these distinguished professors we have here? They're listening. And, they, and if they hear a lie and I let it stand, they're going to jump my ass. Boom. <laughs> right, know, right, precisely. You know, or, they or, like, even when you make up a basic mistake, like I think, all, all, all these Sigma Gamma Rows are mad because yesterday I was rattling off all the names and the colors and I said Sigma Gamma Row was blue and white because I was thinking if I why, made a Sigma. Why, why would you mess with Sigma? First of all, because first of all. Well, you're looking at a Sigma. But, Shut but, up. But they ain't relevant to me. Oh, <laughs> you know. But, 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 but Greg is an alpha right there. So, you, you know, know, we got, you got two alphas in here. So, you know, I mean, it's a cute little group. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> to raise your question. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, yeah, Joe, my question is this. Um, how do you manage to keep your message on point and keep the show, your direction of your show on point when there's so much other noise around and there's so many other platforms and so much other stuff that goes on? You know what I mean? Like black people, there's so much entertainment. There's so much um, other distractions. How do you keep focused on news and media and keep that on point? I have a great staff. Uh, first of all, I, 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 there is no way I could do what I do without uh, Sherry. There is no way. Uh, and, and then my producers, a couple of producers, and our interns. So their charge every day is after we get off the show, we have a production meeting. All right, what, what went down? What, was a, what got a good response? 
uh, that type of thing. But then their job, all day long, people think, well, it ends, you, you end at 10 o'clock. Oh, no. We are constantly, uh, we're constantly reading, uh, re reviewing the news, analyzing it, what was said, what wasn't said, how it was said. And then, then in the morning, which starts for me about 3 a.m., uh, the producer is 4 a.m., we're looking at a list of, of, of uh, topics, of, of stories. And we then decide as a team uh, which ones we think folks want to hear about. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, a, there's a couple of approaches we take. Which ones will, will get people talking and give people an opportunity to vent and, and express their opinion? Then there's a list of shows, what are you going to do about it? Mm. See, I can't, for example, when, when the, the slap heard around the, the globe, or the world, there's anything I can do about that. Right. None, none of us can do anything right. about that. But I knew damn well that we were going to spend four hours talking about <laughs> it. So, that, you know, so that's, it, that's how I, I do. But the most important thing is, is thinking critically. Every, again, with that third, listening with that third ear, reading with that third eye, am I hearing the truth? Is there a story behind the mm. story that people need to know so that I'm really educating my, uh, my audience? And then the final thing I do is to debunk all of this lies. And the critical race theory was the, it, it comes to, to uh, my, my uh, mind. And I, I'll say this, I was thinking of this while we were sitting here, Roland. We, we all were arguing, oh, they don't know what the critical race theory is. They don't know what the critical race theory is. And that was what was, that people kept saying. And I didn't know what the critical race, I hadn't heard of it. But I think that's the wrong thing we should be saying. Mm -hmm. We should be saying, what is the critical race theory? Right. We should be educating ourselves right. as to how it got started, who was the architect, what it is meant, uh, and, and, and quit responding to, to, by saying, well, they don't know. Well, the reality is, we didn't know either. Right. That's what I said. <laughs> we I didn't said, know yeah. either. I told people, I said, I done run three black newspapers, black radio station, black website, black magazine. I said, I had never heard of critical race So, so, so our about. responsibility right. is to, to educate. And that's, that's the umbrella uh, that I educate. And then once you're educated, right. then what are you going to do about it? I mm -hmm. keep going. I, see, and I get these folks that call in. This goes back to the first question about callers, callers. Go ahead. Go ahead. Keep Go ahead. Now, here's the, my final question. What are you going to do about Boom. it? Boom. Not what is Roland going to do. Not what Madison what is going to do. do. What, what are, are you prepared to, to do? do about it? And you the, usually get crickets. Yep. Yep. Same thing. Because most people don't do anything. And, and that's why we call it radioactive. And as it, look, I did the same when I was on WVON in Chicago. I would do the exact same thing. Don't sit here and call bitch and mom what you going to do. All right. Final question from the panel by Alpha. <laughs> Bro. I, I appreciate that, Roland. Well, we know uh, Baba Joe, you and uh, Baba Dick Gregory, another Alpha, was thick as brothers. So, I mean, we know <laughs> that? you ain't got nothing against Alpha. That was your man. So, mm -hmm. anyway, I want to ask you about something that, uh, that you undertook in terms of action right around the time, a little bit after the time the book came out. Uh, of course, we all remember in November you started that hunger strike. Yeah, uh, so November 8th. Right. Yes, sir. And so I guess my question is, you mentioned Ron Daniels, you mentioned the great Ron Walters, you've seen and been at the center of so many battles, political battles. You know, obviously a sense of, a sense of urgency animated that decision. You literally put your health on the line, sacrifice. I guess my question is, looking at this country right now, how close do you think this country is to a potential political fracture? Given the fact that you said, look, I feel so strongly about this that I'm willing to put my health on the line. We've got to get this right. How close do you think this country is? Are we on the verge of something that maybe we've never seen before in history? Oh, yeah. I, I, think, I think we are literally looking at, a, 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 and it may not be like the first civil war. Uh, I think we are looking at some form of civil war. 
I, I, when I did that hunger strike, one of the problems I had was people were having moments, not, and they weren't creating a movement because people weren't sacrificing. God bless the folks who were, some people were getting arrested and going to jail. Some folk were getting arrested and they were getting traffic tickets, or what I call citation. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, and, and then, and I didn't think that there was enough pressure. So I channeled Dick Gregory. I kept thinking, what would Dick do? And I talked to his son, Christian, and we had a very lengthy conversation. He said to me, he said, you know, Joe, you know what uh, Dick would, you know, my dad would do. First of all, he'd probably go on a hunger strike and he wouldn't ask anybody. Uh, but I had to ask my wife. And she, she only agreed. She said, now, first of all, you're not that 34, 36-year-old <laughs> kid you were when you and Dick were doing hunger strike. You were, man... You, if, as folk kept reminding me, you in your 70s now. <laughs> I wasn't feeling 70. Uh, and so she said, but you got to go to the doctor. Doctor said, why do you want to do this? I explained. And he, he gave me the go ahead. You're okay. Um, and I never will forget. We were, we, I got in the car. We we're driving out of the parking lot at the doctor's office. And my wife looked at me. And she had never done this before. She said, are you telling me that you're willing to die for this cause? And I looked at her with one word and said, yes, in the conversation. And here's what I said. I'm doing this because I don't want my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren to ask, Papa, what were you doing when the end of the second reconstruction mm. was starting. I know what they did at the, at the end of the first reconstruction. The first thing they went after was the vote. It was the birth of the Klan. They burned down churches. They lynched people all over the vote. And I saw the same thing happening. And I may not live to see the end of the second reconstruction, but while I'm alive, I'm not going to have my grandchildren asking me, what did you do to stop it? Mm -hmm. And so that's what started the hunger strike. I think we are, we are just a hair trigger away mm -hmm. from some real serious conflict if we don't stand up, speak up, and, and I'm telling you, November 8th, and, and I'm saying this to everybody, don't sit here and wait until October to get started. That's right. Don't wait till September to get started. We need to mobilize now. That's and, right. and I'm saying this to all the leaders. They can get mad at me, at me if they want to. Take it over. I'm like Dick. I don't care. And I'm not asking your permission. Will y'all please check your egos at the door? Mm. Check your egos at the door. And, you know, that's the old Quincy Jones sign that mm. was over when they did We Are the World. We Are the World. Oh, he, he, he brought together the greatest artist in the, in the world, and he had a sign. Check your egos at the door and get organized and, mo more important, mobilize. Nancy Pelosi said something to me when we, when they, just as they were past the uh, uh, Emmett Till uh, anti lynching bill. God bless uh, Bobby Rush, man. And he stuck with it. Mm -hmm. But she said something in this bill signing ceremony uh, th that she did at the Capitol. And she invited me to it. And Steny Hoyer invited me. Said, um, she said, you know what? In Congress, we maneuver. That's what we do up here. We maneuver votes. We maneuver what y'all did to get this bill passed, and I say y'all because it wasn't just me, mm -hmm. you mobilized. Yep. And that's what got that bill passed. Organized, after, mobilized. After 250 attempts, after 250 attempts, and what, over uh, 100 years? We mo and that's what we have to do. Organize and mobilize, and I'm telling all of them, Check your ego at the door, because this, if we don't, if we right. lose on November 8th, it, uh, we're in deep doo-doo. I've been warning folks the same as well, and 
uh, in channeling Reese, and I said this uh, in 2008 on CNN, uh, vote or shut the hell up. Uh, it, but it was funny, we were at the Democratic National Convention and we were under the tunnel and I see Brian Williams and he pulls me aside and he says, I'm loving the stuff that you do. He's saying, you're right, vote or shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> I cracked up Damn. laughing, but that's it. All right, put, and, a, and, put a dollar in the cuss jar. Yeah, well, ain't no problem. Yeah. I, so that means $99 would go to the Brenda Funk fan club. Oh no, that's not true. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's, 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 your, that's yours. Y'all, uh, the book is called uh, Radioactive, a memoir of advocacy and action on the air and in the streets. Uh, my man, my homie, my friend, Probably. Joe Madison, y'all, I'm telling y'all, y'all relax. We talk all the time offline. We see each I other. I hope they realize this was a treat, man, because we haven't done this on air That's true. That's long. true. That's, that's true. I mean, this is raw. Yeah. Or, or, I'm sorry, unfiltered. Yeah, you, <laughs> there you go. There you go. We see each other. Y'all understand. We see each other at events. Me and Joe be on the side like, yeah, this is some bullshit. Yeah, I know. Like, man, how long we got to be here listening to this bullshit? I'm telling you, if y'all could actually hear those conversations and some of the stuff. Excuse me. <laughs> I put it in the book. <laughs> Get, it's in the book. Get y'all a copy. I'm going to have Joe sign it right now. I we didn't are, sign that. We are, I don't know if you signed You yeah. did. I'm sorry. Okay. All what right. did, you, what you did, did I sign say? It. You are... Go, the goat, Joe Madison, the Black Eagle. You no, are man, the goat. That's you, you man. I uh, always enjoyed our friendship. Uh, look, you've always been an honest truth teller. It's all about it's all about it, giving folks hell and letting them know that we ain't backing down. Or as, as Sidney Poitier said to me, "There's," he said, "There's no back up in you." There you go. That's really cool. There's no back. I like that. There's That's no it. backup in you. So ain't no backup in you. That's why I say I ain't going back to the uh, uh, end of the first reconstruction. No. And I'm not going to allow my children to, to go through That's what it. we went through or what our folks went through That's before it. 100 years. I'm not going to allow it. I appreciate it, my brother. All right. I appreciate man. it. All right, folks. Back to our Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. <laughs> Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rollins. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Come <laughs>